And um, today, I would like to show you my idea of a better future and how we can reach it. And because I'm a scientist, I would like to do it a bit evidence-based. But because I also like polemics, it will be a bit polemic here and there. So, and yeah, so smart villages or smart cities, for me, like there's only one option of these two. And I think in the end, we will maybe share it or not. So let's see. So I started on this journey by observing like this fact here. So we're discussing a lot about animals. And when I'm asking people what do chickens actually prefer, most people would agree, hey, of course, here on the bottom left, chickens are free to roam around. They can eat where they want. They can meet other chickens. They can sleep. So they're not forced to anything. And um, yeah, but actually, I'm coming from Zurich. So it's said to be one of the most livable cities in the world. So always behind Austria or, or in front of Austria. So it's kind of a place people want to be. But for me, when I bike through the city, it often seems very similar to this chicken factory. So it doesn't depend. So like even the older structures or these new buildings, they look pretty much the same. And I'm wondering where are humans actually more happy. So and of course, in the first glance, it doesn't seem like uh, but for chickens, we know it. For humans, we don't know it. I feel also most humans would like to live here on the left. But also science is telling us actually that humans in nature, they have less um, depression. They're more happy. They have a higher life satisfaction. They live in sustainable life. They, the cognitive performance is increased. So there are a lot of beneficial things happening in nature. and putting this uh, yeah, forward, so like this comparison between cities and villages, there are actually many more of these categories where villages outcompete cities. So in, in the case of health, you have less asthmatic diseases, less um, allergies, also re um, re respiratory diseases. I think it's kind of a thing right now. So like actually in villages, you are far better off. You're also not so lonely. So you have stronger community with other people. And um, yeah, autonomy. Usually people own bigger properties. They can grow their own food. They have their own tools. They can construct things. It's also something um, James Scott observed. So in his book, he analyzed the cities in um, Upper Southeast Asia and like how cities emerged there. It was always this thing that actually centralized entities try to get as many people around them to better control them because you can have the police close to you and the military, and they're also easier to tax. So it's also a thing, if you don't like taxes, maybe villages are preferable. And because of the great autonomy, also the consumption is much lower in villages. So cities, they rely a lot on the system yeah, to get their food, to get things done. And yeah, of course, it's a bit of an unfair comparison. I could have chosen also attributes where cities probably outcompete villages. So all in all, I think one can say that cities are more efficient than villages. So if you find or you define a goal function, cities are very good at optimizing it. So we want cultural life, so we have a lot of cultural life. We want a high income, a lot of high income. Yeah, so but they're optimizing for this one thing usually. And not yeah, accounting for these externalities, which are basically not optimized for. On the other hand, you have villages. They are more plentiful. So maybe you have an, yeah, a plumber in the one village, a plumber in the other village. So if an earthquake happens, you still have a plumber in the other village, which could be exchanged. So they are more resilient, these villages. But in general, not very efficient. Yeah, so it, yeah, this is what one can say. But in the end, it depends on us how we want to live. We want to live in a resilient place or in an efficient place. And I think that currently we have this trend that people are moving to the cities. Yeah, so there are like these statistics telling us that by 2050, I think 70% of the world population will live in cities. And as far as I know, I know a lot of people who like resilience, so I would guess it's a, a pretty high number. So what is the reason? Why is this life concentrating right now in cities? And I identified, or we basically identified these two mechanisms, which are 
answers to these two questions, which basically manifest this structure. So one is like, who can know what is the goal? So what do we want to optimize? What do we want to strive for in the society? And the second is, when we identify this goal, how do we implement it? How, to, how do we reach it? And in my opinion, there are two old beliefs which basically manifest the structure of a city. And I want to briefly explore them with you. So who can know? And actually, we heard it today, back in the days, it was the church. So the church had a holy book and they had the direct connection to God and they basically knew what is right and wrong, whom I can love, whom I can't love. Yeah? This got replaced like uh, yeah, some, some hundred years ago by the state. So now the state has a holy book, which they call law book, and they have all these public servants working on it, the ministers and writing into this book and basically knowing what is the good consumption and what is the bad consumption. Yeah, so alcohol is okay for a healthy society and the other thing, not. And recently, this gets more and more replaced by corporations. So now they have the programmers, they're writing the holy code, and they, are, they seem to have the knowledge about what I can say and what I can't say. Yeah, so what is free speech, what is hate speech? So basically, I can't know it. And I basically edited it, like recently, this one I can, I have the feeling, I, I don't know how to fit it to, um, correctly into this graphic, maybe it's the kind of a merger of the previous three things, but kind of now, yeah, you probably have to have a PhD degree and be a professor, own a lot of money, and then you are basically eligible to define what is the right thing to do. And what is common to all of these um, yeah, developments is that you always have a centralized entity knowing what is correct, and it's not you, yeah? it's someone else lying outside telling you what is right. And out of this, a lot of suffering can follow. Yeah? So on the individual level, yeah, people could not be together with the person they loved, but also on the societal level. So like in the US currently, the war on drugs led to the, one of the biggest prison, prison populations on Earth. So there are also societal problems connected with these normative decisions. But let's assume we go step back, we know what we want to reach. Yeah? So we know, hey, we want to go there. How is our society currently implementing these things? Yeah? And what we do, we have these hierarchical organizations. We do it by hierarchy. And basically everything is organized like this. Our states, our cities, our companies, but also our NGOs, like name it uh, Greenpeace, WWF, all of them, they function like this. But the problem with these hierarchical structures is that the quality of management decisions are actually pretty poor because they don't obtain the real feedback from the ground because of the power structure and like fear and other reasons, biases, self-selection biases. Um, the real state of the world is not traveling upwards and this can lead to problems. So for example, in Germany, the German government decided that, hey, we know that we want to save the nature and the only way to go forward is to um, spare CO2. So like all the researchers, everyone is saying this. So this is kind of we agreed as a society to do. And now, how do we reach it? Reducing CO2. And what they did actually, they introduced biofuel. So you have fuel now where you put like plant, like yeah, fuel from plants inside, like five to 10%. And they subsidized the planting of bio crops in Germany. And the result was actually, as the German newspaper titled, we're now putting the rainforest into our cars. Yeah, so because what happened, German farmers stopped planting animal feeds. Somewhere else, these animal feeds had to be planted. So it was shifted to South America and led to the destruction of the rainforest there. So kind of even when we know, hey, we want to reduce CO2, the way how we're doing it often seems not to work. So, and here we have these two problems. So we have, first is a normative problem. Who can decide what is the good thing, the goal we want to optimize? And then it's like kind of a control problem. How do we establish this thing? Yeah? And as a researcher now, what you do, you go a step backward, like you try to describe the problem and then maybe find a solution. And this is what I want to do now with you. So basically stepping a step backward, how we can describe our world is basically we can describe it, describe it as a complex system. So these complex systems 
can be understood as a network of networks. Yeah, so, and basically, they are characterized by the fact that not the individual actors, the nodes in this image are important, but more the connections, the links between the nodes. These are the important thing. So, or in other words, a complex system is more than the sum of its parts. Yeah? And this has consequences. So, and one of them is that it often behaves very un unintuitively. So like cause and effect doesn't hold like in like how I would experience it here if I drop this, I hear sound. But basically what happens is that small changes can have some cascading effects, like huge effects, and sometimes huge inputs change nothing. This is also sometimes known as a butterfly effect, so a swap of a butterfly here can lead to a tornado on the other side of the world. So, and what does this actually mean for us? It means that no one can really know yeah, how things will be in the future. Yeah, so how to reach, like, or what should be a state? Because like the importance does not lie in the nodes. So you can't have a supercomputer, you can't have a single human being or a group of people. And even if we would know it through these cascading failures, we would not know how to reach the state without destroying the rainforest or something like this. And this I really want to emphasize, like a complex system cannot be steered like a car or controlled like a coffee machine. Yeah? And the thing is, like, every day we're adding links to this network, so the complexity is basically growing. It's like a combina combinatorial growth, not just exponential. So I think exponential no, I mean, nowadays many people know. So it's even quicker than this. And yeah, this basically leads us to these problems which we're seeing and these old beliefs how society can be structured are kind of coming to an end. And the question is, can we replace it? Or is there an answer, is there a solution? Can we do something else? And here, I have a good message. Yes, there are. So who can actually decide what we should reach? What is the goal? Where we want to go? And the question is, all of us together, somehow. Yeah, so it's like there's this phenomenon which basically justifies this statement, which is called wisdom of the crowds. It was first observed on an ox auction, so basically a cow auction in uh, England, where people were asked to, to guess the weight of these ox, yeah, of these cows there. Yeah? And they would have gotten a prize if they um, guessed the weight correctly. And none of them actually guessed the weight, but the mathematician came around and he averaged all the guesses, and it was actually almost exactly the weight of the cow. I think just some decimals were wrong. And this is actually a phenomenon which can be repeated. Yeah, so you can repeat this with your children, maybe in a birthday or like, like something like this. And there's also a nice BBC video, one can check it out. So this wisdom of the crowds is something which can be observed. And now is the question, can we actually use this for our society, for our human world, for our complex world, not just in these small incidents. And there's this experiment, like this good judgment project, where actually average citizens are asked about the future state of the world. Yeah, so uh, when will North Korea launch the next uh, rocket? Um, how will the refugee streams develop? Um, what will happen in Belarus? So like these kind of questions. But they actually found out that the crowd is performing more or less as well as a CIA analyst, or sometimes even better, even they don't have access to this classified information. So something to build on, I would say. So we're pretty good in knowing what will happen. Even if the knowledge does not lie in a single one of us, it can emerge out of our interactions. I would say this is also something what makes our, yeah, not maybe democracy, but our pluralistic society kind of strong. Yeah, so like this collective intelligence. So how does it work? Very simple. There's three principles one has to follow. One has to guarantee free access to information, so everyone should access information freely. We need privacy to reason about it, to interact with our neighbors, to think about it, to also make mistakes, and then to have freedom of speech and letting the information out again. So if this is enabled, basically this wisdom of the crowds can function, and if one tries now to spoil some of these steps, then the crowd can also be led to a wrong direction. That's something one needs to take care of, so wisdom of the crowds does not always 
work, but if we set up the mechanisms right, it can. So now we have these, uh, yeah, basically now we know how we can, uh, we know who can decide, so it's us. So basically how can we implement these things in our society, yeah? And if we look to nature, we see many of such phenomena, like basically self-organizing systems, bottom-up. So this is a flock of birds, which is very interesting because it has very good properties for the birds inside of this flock. Yeah, you have a good protection against enemies, you very easily identify food resources around, but and maybe because of this, no one is forced to join this flock of birds. Yeah, so all these birds are voluntarily inside of this flock, and the most interesting thing is there's no controlling birds inside. Yeah? No bird controlling where it should go. It's a very simple interaction mechanism in place. Yeah? So if I'm too close to another bird, I fly away. If I'm too far away, I fly back again. Very simple feedback and the system uh, moves forward. And what is interesting, like this is very resilient. Yeah? So if a hunter comes around and tries to kill the controlling bird, it's not possible because it doesn't exist. So it's, it's, and if we go a step further, basically self-organizing systems are everywhere. So also our human body is such kind of a system. So it's not the brain controlling everything. It's also, we have our immune system, which is pretty strong, totally decentralized. You have all these different nutritions in your body, which give feedback to different organs and it's going back and forward and like having their, something controlling would probably just mess around with everything. So this is like nature. Can we also take this to our society? And there actually has been research in traffic jams in cities. Yeah, so how usually traffic is managed in the cities. You have a centralized authority and they plan how the traffic lightning will be in the city. So in the morning you have a green wave here, in the evening you have it there, after football matches you have a different plan, and it often ends up in traffic jams. And what researchers have been doing is actually they designed a system and they tested it in Dresden, and now they're selling it, So, but it's very hard to get this uh, sold, as I heard. But the thing is, what they did actually they let every traffic light on its own decide how to optimize the flow locally just by communicating with the neighboring traffic lights. Yeah, so basically there was communication on the bottom level, but no traffic light had the overview of the whole system state. And by following this very simple uh, principle, actually the average waiting time for all of these um, yeah, traffic participants got reduced. So that's something very nice. And how does it work? Again, it's actually simpler than before. So we are humans, we are acting. Even if you sleep or you just sit, you're doing an action. So it's all kind of a behavior. This has an effect on our environment. This environment changes and ideally gives us feedback back. But if we don't get this feedback, for example, because like the rainforest is too far away, or we don't see the consequences of old people in isolation or something like this, we are not able to change our behavior. But this is actually important for self-organization, so that people can locally change and adjust the behavior. Okay, so actually, perfect. So now we are basically here. I kind of, I would say, at a crossroad, but I think it's nothing very new. So we have always been there. So always, as we heard, like just in the previous talk, there were always new technologies coming, joining. So people always had to decide how to use technology to proceed forward. And I think the one way how technology actually can be used is to make these very efficient systems more resilient which would lead into smart cities. And the other way would be make these very resilient structures more efficient. That's something what we could do. And what do I mean with it? 
So actually what we're doing right now, which is my observation, is like we're using all this computational power, all this technology which we're having to kind of collect data, to gather and gather more of it, to better predict the future, to make this machine learning and statistical analysis just to know how the future could look like, and then to be in the position to force people to behave somehow to reach there or to come to a different state like we have to save two two degrees it cannot get warmer than this and uh, yeah so these are like these general statements and how do we do it how do we implement them by surveillance yeah so we are observing people how they behave if they do something wrong they get punished and we have these corona apps now also tracking people yeah that's the one way to go forward but actually the other way forward could also be hey we're also already having some resilient structures. Yeah, so we're having these networks of people. We are here network, the, the geographical networks. So like people are already organized. They're kind of resilient. Yeah, so they're not depending too much on the system. And how can we actually make these structures more efficient? And I think I don't need to talk too much about this slide, I think most of you are probably more uh, knowledgeable than me and all these technologies which are out there. You could use 3D printing, you could rethink money, have a real truly democratized or decentralized money. We can do home office, yeah, so we can be in nature and outside for those who are able to do it. We can meet with people together, we can form these communal places of interactions like here, which I think is very important also for this wisdom of the crowd to emerge in the end. And I'm pretty sure there are also many non-digital solutions like permaculture or like these kind of things. So the question is really where do we use technology and where not? But if we use it, I would say we should rather go forward to this solution. And yeah, so maybe coming briefly to an end, how I see it, it's so basically this knowledge of these complex systems and these self-organizing systems yeah, and this wisdom of the crowd phenomenon inside of it, it's basically kind of like a ray of light, like something hopeful for me, but also an obligation. So I think it's very hopeful because we know that in the end it depends on us. Yeah? So even if I do just something very minor, giving here a speech or not even maybe just being present here, already can have an effect. Yeah. So cascading, it's like really, it's not obvious and it, it has an effect. Yeah? So that's one thing. And all of us are really important in forming this goal where we want to reach. Yeah? So every single one of us, if we are small or tall, old and young, sick or healthy, it doesn't really matter. It's like all kind of part of it. But um, I think out of this also comes this obligation, yeah? So we have this responsibility to do these things, to go out, to do stuff, really manifesting the reality we want to see in this world. And hence, I yeah, see it a bit like probably Immanuel Kant, so we always have the uh, possibility to emerge out of this self-imposed immaturity and in the end to really decide if we want to be chicken in a factory or free human beings like incorporating like or engaging with our neighbors and i think in the end it's up to you up to me up to all of us and yeah with this i want to close thank you very much thank you very much and now it's time for questions So, who has the first one? Uh, hello. Uh, I, uh, how, when you were talking about the wisdom of the crowds or the collective intelligence, I think it's a very... Uh, it can be used to assess the truth and maybe even to predict the future. But how do you think that we can avoid it from making choices for us? Because uh, there will be many outliers and people whose choices will not align with what the this wisdom of the crowds decides. Yep. Yeah, so. I, I totally agree. So uh, there's answer on many levels, but I think the simplest one is like, it's the one step deciding what we want to have. But I think the self-organization 
like is the next step. So no one should be forced to be part of this flock of birds. Yeah. So, and I think even those with extreme opinions or like outliers, they kind of part of this goal function, even if in the end they are not subscribing to it. Yeah, they should have the freedom to step out of it because in the end, how self-organization works. So of course. There is a danger in the end that you say, hey, we have this cool tool, we are all participating in it, it tells us we should not go outside anymore, and then you're forced to do it. So this is, of course, again, something very dystopian, I, w I, I would say. But um, it's a principle or a mechanism which in combination with others can, can work. Yeah. But also what I mentioned is like, it can really be misused. So if you have no privacy or you have no so, for example, in this example with the cows now, like like guessing, so like you need to have a free access to information. If you if you would restrict half of them, half of the people, maybe even biased people, maybe just the small ones, not to go to the cow to see it, then they would lack this piece of information, and probably then, like uh, this wisdom of the crowd would be disturbed and uh, come to problems. But I'm not so sure. I, I, I yeah, this would need to be checked. I think there probably there are some studies, but. Yeah, these are the principles which need to be fulfilled, and I'm pretty sure that right now most of them are not fulfilled. Yeah. Other questions? Maybe I'll, I'll ask for one. Um, how do you perceive the trends in the world right now, like uh, mm. regarding what we are talking about, let's say, general? So. What is the practice, or maybe if you can give some examples, what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I I think the biggest problem I think right now is like this freedom of expression and like having like opposing opinions, like also in an academic context like this. That's um, kind of problematic, I think. Also like how academia is working and forming these opinions, like also in context with this technocracy. We are, like, I'm kind of observing that only experts are allowed to voice an opinion are valuable, but not all the others. So, out of this perspective, yeah, I think the free, like, the freedom of expression and following from this, the free access to information is lacking, and many people are, yeah, probably misled. But I, I, I yeah, I don't know. That's my my take on it. I see. So, um, and um, do you have any idea how? For example, to fix it, like what could be the way out from? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think the way out is like really through this self-organization by doing small steps, as I see it. Like you know, like everyone can start changing things locally, and this can have bigger effects. And that's like a very pragmatic way forward. I don't see it really changing quickly from top or from somewhere else. I think. Yeah, we need to really do it, like even by such events like here, like meeting physically, talking, expression, uh, expressing ideas. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe uh, I was also wondering, like, uh, maybe in uh, Switzerland, for example, or also the university environment. Yeah, if there you can see any trends for self-organization kind of modern trends, of course, that there is some level of self-organization and autonomy. Uh, in, inside of academia, yeah. <laughs> I think it's like also a very strict hierarchical system in the end. Like uh, you have like yeah, professors, which uh, like kind of yeah, everyone wants to reach this position inside of academia. So until you're not a professor, you're not very free. And until when you have reached it, you have other pressures like publishing, like these things. and. One can go here into details like how publishing works, but in the end, um, you cannot very step very far outside of what is believed currently. So, like, it's always very minor steps and kind of keeping people together, like around an idea. Yeah. So, isn't it the way to let's say do some activities that can have impact outside? of the academic structures, this... I, so yeah, we're trying traditional. sometimes. <laughs> so, that's, that's and I think it's really, because like I think what many people carry 
with themselves with this belief that it has to be like it is, or what the speaker before said, that it's like kind of, uh, it's a paradigm, it's always like how it is, but we have very good reasons to think that actually self-organization is much, much, much more efficient and maybe also more aligned with our values than what we're doing right now with this centralized control system. And there's research about it, so there are papers, studies, like simulations, experiments, so yeah, it's like one way to see the world and um, yeah, in the end I think it's a normative decision what, how we want to use it. Because I think you can also make the case in saying, hey, we have these efficient structures, we just make them more resilient. And that's basically the mainstream, also in academia, so big data analysis, machine learning, all of these things. And I think most people are not aware that it's in the end a decision what we want to have. No. Okay, thank you. So. Yeah, another question here. Hi, good evening. Um, please bear with me because I feel this question is going to take forever to lay down because I have to go through several things, but I would really like to, to get your feedback on this. If we go back about 200 years to the first industrial revolution and then to the second and, and now on into the third industrial revolution, what we have is basically once the general industry, the, the general purpose platform behind things, the um, energy matrix, the, the, the sources of energy, the communication basically uh, systems around, and the logistics, every time that they change significantly, we have an industrial revolution. There is sort of like a very big word left unsaid when you explained, uh, when you moved from centralization to decentralization, which is capitalism. The inner logic of capitalism is entrepreneurialism. You have to compete to achieve better prices for the consumer. You have to compete, compete, compete. I mean, competition is something that you, you have to keep doing, basically. So for some authors, now we're entering into a stage where technology has gotten so better because there is so much, uh, so much investment in technology to get more competitive that we're approaching near zero, the near zero marginal cost society, basically. Authors would argue that this uh, approach is like gets at, uh, get, get, get us um, closer to a to a state where the sharing economy and creating like um, not functioning around profit, like uh, a future of profit being defunct, not going for profit, not uh, existing to get our existence into the into the market, but beyond, right? All of this is possible because of uh, the kind of technologies you were you were mentioning, 3D printing, the breaching, the going from the bits economy to the atoms economy, the centralization education, uh, 3D printing, all of that, um, the centralized and lateral scales, uh, lateral scaled means of production, basically. So what I would like to know, basically, which is kind of like the the, the uncomfortable question to ask, is how would you conceive? a society not based on the market, but beyond the market, right? Based on the technologies um, currently um, available, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so it's a good, I think in the end it's a question, what is the market? Um, I have this one view, I think as long as it's physical, you cannot overcome shortage of resources. Of course, in the digital world, you can have it but not in the physical world. So like what you said, like with these marginal costs, they're getting lower and lower. I don't see it happening in the physical world, probably. But um, yeah, overcoming the market, like, yeah, I, hmm. what is the market in the end? Yeah, so, um, it's a difficult question. So I, I, I would say in the end, you, um, not overcoming the market in the sense that people will always interact or talk with each other and negotiate things or live together, but having this price tag maybe out of the equation, this would be something I would like to see. So like maybe more doing it unconditionally, like, hmm? Yeah, so actually this is my, my research uh, project about. So like, of course, one can conceptualize all different types of things and tokens and then give it a number again, but a bit what I saw happening is basically like 100 years ago, um, most things didn't have a price tag. Yeah, so 
the the grandparents lived with with a family at home, so there were no old people homes, so there was no one paid for this. Yeah, you had uh, you helped the neighbor when he was sick, like kind of maybe you cooked some food. Or, so like uh, many things were not uh, monetized. Collaborative. Yeah, collaborative. Yeah. So and this monetization went further and further. So now we pay for a lot of services, which back in the days there was no price tag on top of them. And what happens now in this whole tokenization space, I see it a bit giving price tags to things which don't have a price tag right now. And by this, I think your dystopian idea, probably it's even right now more encouraged that everything becomes a market in this sense that it gives profits and uh, in the end, like reducing to money again or like this, yeah. So I think, in, yeah, in the end, I think people need to do more things unconditionally, just doing it, like, and, yeah, but... Sorry, please microphone to hear it. I'm just going to say that that example was when we lived in a much more nuclear society, but now people are more spread out, they travel more, so that just kind of stopped working. Um, what's the question? No, I'm just making a statement, like, mm. that description was a long time ago, when people didn't travel, mm. you know, you lived in your village, you, you, you were born in your village and you died in your village. Mm. So you had the relationship with your next neighbor, you'd go and cook and they would look after you, you would like them symbiotic. But today's society where you jump on, a, my, my flight to London next week is six euros. I mean, that's, it's more, well, it's almost like two coffees or a flight to London. Yeah. So um, we're a much more mobile society, so we lost this connection with our community. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, I agree. So maybe we have to build community again or coming to a point that society is so nice that you can trust other people more. But then how to reach there from now up to the future, I don't know. I just know if, yeah, I open up a bit more. So maybe the other one tries to open up a bit more. So, but... I, how I think another part of the equation is people are, well, I think people are a lot more selfish today. Yeah, so these are these... Maybe, maybe. So, yeah. So, I think one can have this view on the world, like uh, everyone is selfish. Uh, I would say of myself, I'm not selfish. Probably you would also say you're not selfish, so we're already two. So, like, I think there are more and more people. And I, th I think the problem is we're the minority, and most people are, uh, what's in it for me? So, so yeah, okay, that's the thing. So, I, I, believe, I, I believe that 51% of the people are not selfish. And if it's a slight majority, a mo yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are two against two. She's also very honest. <laughs> so now we can. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's in the end the thing. So I think if you believe other people are selfish, then you would need all this control system in place. Yeah, and if you think that the majority is kind of like okay, like to live with, then you would not need all these controls around you. Yeah, and it's like kind of what you believe in the end, I guess. Okay. Thank One you. more question, please. Over here, in, in the front. Yeah. So if we want to create a smart village, uh, what should we do? What are the first uh, technologies, practices, and values? If we want to do what? Uh, create a smart village. A village. Smart village? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. We can start exploring. <laughs> I, I, it depends. I just know the area I'm from like this, so, and I think getting at first things not like I, you know i think villages are hated a lot out of good reasons like conservatism and some things never change and it's really hard if you're different but i think there are also mechanisms in place which are very nice like i know community like uh, once a year we have a party in the village where i'm from something like this so where all people meet young and old yeah so the the manager up to the lowest worker. So like having like these these um, mechanisms which are there, like festivals, like not not removing them. I think that's the first step. And uh, having like this local participation, so many people still engage on local level in the matters which are there. So and and then trying to step by step to increase them, like local autonomy. And yeah, it's like a bit. I see it and. For my case, probably a space where people can meet like-minded people, something like this here, is probably always a good step. Yeah. But if you already have this, then I don't know, then you have to see for the next step and 
maybe putting some ideas out or developing some tools or trying to talk with people, I don't know.